These are important concepts for infectious diseases, uh, infection control, and antimicrobial stewardship. Um, then, uh, Matt, please. Uh, yeah, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Ramirez. Um, does everybody see my screen? Yes. Cool. And you see my laser pointer? Yes. Cool. All right. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so for those who have been attending all of our grand rounds for the entirety of its length now, uh, this is actually going to be an encore presentation. So I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, I believe it was Dr. Junkins alluded to some of the information that I had presented here. Uh, and um, at that point, Dr. Carrico asked me if I would give this presentation again so that we could actually record it and just have it available for any kind of future reference. Uh, and so I happily obliged. And today I will be rediscussing an introduction to pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics as it relates to infectious diseases. Uh, so to begin, pharmacokinetics. Uh, what I learned in school is that qualitatively, pharmacokinetics was always described as what the body does to the drug. Uh, and to really illustrate what that means, I have this dose response uh, or rather dose exposure curve. And so the study of pharmacokinetics, it's going to give us some of these values here. And so this peak concentration here, uh, the actual magnitude of that, the time it takes to get there, and then the time it takes to go down and leave the body, and then really how that looks like the entire way through uh, is all information that we're able to derive from the study of pharmacokinetics. And when we're talking about pharmacokinetics, we focus on these four main characteristics here, and that's going to be drug absorption, drug distribution, drug metabolism, and drug elimination. Uh, so to begin with drug absorption, uh, this, is, this is a term that's often interchanged with another term that we use commonly, and that's called bioavailability. And essentially what absorption or bioavailability is, is that it's the difference between the drug that is delivered or the amount of drug that is delivered versus the amount of drug that is available in the body to be used. Uh, to illustrate that further, I'll just describe two of our main ways of administering drugs in the in hospital settings, and that's going to be intravenous medication. And so when you think about intravenous administration, you take all of the drug and you put it into the vasculature and it's immediately all available to be used in the body. Uh, because we're able to do that, you really don't see that much of a difference. Uh, so we often regard that as 100% bioavailable. Contrast that to oral administration. So we have like a tablet or a capsule. It's given to the patient. You know, they take it with uh, maybe with food, maybe with water. It goes down the esophagus into the stomach where it is encounters potentially a uh, stomach acid, and then it's moved around with um, wave-like muscle contractions, eventually gets down to the duodenum and encounters potentially bile salts from the gallbladder or digestive enzymes from the pancreas, and eventually moves into the jejunum and the ileum where it's ultimately absorbed back into the bloodstream. Uh, and so the really, the, the point of just illustrating all those different things is that along that more complicated path, there is all these greater potentials for loss of drug. Uh, and so often when we have oral medications, uh, we, we see that their bioavailability is not 100%. Uh, uh, there are some instances where we do get uh, up to about 100% of bioavailability with oral administrative drugs, but more often than not, it's about less so. Um, but after the drug makes its way into the, into the bloodstream, either directly intra, through the intravenous administration or orally, um, or orally absorbed from the gut, the next thing it does is that we wanna know where it goes in the body and that's called drug distribution. And so a couple of places it really can go anywhere um, or it potentially can go anywhere, it depends on the drug, but some of the places it can go includes the central nervous system, the pulmonary tissues, the gastrointestinal tissues, urinary tract, bone, uh, uh, joints, any other connective tissue, dermis or epidermis. And when we think about distribution, we often think about the distribution of a particular drug in comparison to the concentration that it achieves within the serum. Uh, so for instance, uh, when it comes to urine, we often have a concentration that is far greater or, or a ratio that is greater within the urinary tract than we do in the serum. And that's because a lot of drugs are renally eliminated and the volume in which they, uh, um, the volume of the urinary tract is lower than the volume of the rest of the body. And so we see a concentration happening there. Uh, you contrast that to the central nervous system which is protected by a blood-brain barrier, which actually can impede the distribution of drug into that space. Uh, and so what we're resulting in concentrations basically not as high as achievable within the serum tissue. And when it, bringing this back to infectious diseases, this is all important because uh, when it comes to this, uh, when it comes to knowing the distribution of individual drugs, it's important because we can have infections at basically all these different sites. 
And so, you know, CNS, we can have like a meningitis or ventriculitis. Sometimes you can and, pop in here. No, we, uh, with the lungs, we can have like pneumonia um, with the, uh, with bones, osteomyelitis. And so whether a drug will actually distribute to that tissue will help us understand whether or not it's going to be a viable option to treat an infection in that space. Uh, so following uh, distribution of drug, in, eventually everything's going to make it back to the liver. Uh, it's, a, it's a highly perfused organ. And in the liver is going to be the site of the main, uh, the, the next main characteristic of pharmacokinetics, which is metabolism. Uh, and so in the liver, what we see is that we have a lot of different enzymes. Uh, and the, these enzymes, are, they're mo, mo, a lot of times they're cytochrome enzymes is just the term that we use. But what they do is they interact with these drugs and they can form metabolites. And metabolites are roughly broken down into two main categories, and that are active metabolites or inactive metabolites. And so active metabolites actually can, uh, and the reason, the, the reason they're called active is that they can have exert a similar pharmacological effect as the parent drug, whereas inactive metabolites don't. And that's really where we start to see somewhat of an overlap between metabolism and elimination. Uh, and, and so after, after a drug may or may not be metabolized, so not all drugs are metabolized, it's eventually going to be needed to be eliminated from the body. Uh, and that's where um, we primarily see elimination through either the feces or the urinary tract. It's uh, not limited primarily to these two pathways. You can also eliminate drug through other means such as breathing. Um, but in general, this is gonna be our two main pathways of eliminating drugs. Uh, and then understanding metabolism and elimination is important for pharmacokinetics because it affects our drug adjustments. And so when it comes to metabolism, uh, often nowadays we have an aging population. And so the amount of drugs that the average person takes continues to go up. Uh, we're starting to see more and more drug interactions come into play. And essentially what happens is that we give a patient drug A and they're already taking drug B. And we see that drug B actually might have either compete with drug A in terms of meta uh, interaction with this enzyme or drug B can actually influence this enzyme to either usually work much better or much worse. And so what happens is that drug A or the new drug that's administered, its levels can be altered in the body. Uh, and we have to account for that. So, and often some of the things that we can do to account for that include drug adjustments or either holding medication altogether. I think a really good example of the, um, the importance or the impact of uh, drug and drug interactions nowadays is actually with the, um, the commonly prescribed antiviral for COVID now. It's uh, Paxlovid, it's um, Nutremlevir and Ritonavir. And so the Ritonavir is actually intended to inhibit the metabolism of the first antiviral drug to boost its levels, which is cool because it has a therapeutic effect there, but it's also um, potentially problematic if the patient is taking any other drug that might potentially interact with those drugs as well. Uh, last thing, when it comes to elimination, we can have organ damage, which can affect our ability to eliminate drug uh, in the same way that a normal person might be. And in those situations, we can uh, make dose adjustments. So we either change the dose or we change the frequency of administration, or in some cases, we, we should not just use it at all because we will never achieve safe concentrations in the body. And so, uh, whereas pharmacokinetics is the study of what the body does to the drug, pharmacodynamics is really the study of what the drug does to the body. Uh, and to illustrate that, I wanna go back to that same uh, drug exposure curve I was talking about on the earlier slide. Uh, and so again, pharmacokinetics, it gives us this, really, this information here. But when it comes to pharmacodynamics, we're thinking more about these values over here. And so the MEC, it stands for the minimal effective concentration. And that's really the, um, the, the smallest amount of drug to exert its pharmacological effect. And, and then we always take that into consideration with the MTC, which is the minimal toxic concentration. And the space between these two numbers, we call it the therapeutic range. And so essentially we're always trying to get within this range. It's, it's somewhat of like a, like a Goldilocks situation. It's uh, not too hot or not too cold. Um, we, want to, we want the drug to work, but we don't want to see any toxicities in the drug. And so when we get a little bit more specific with the concepts of pharmacodynamics when it comes to infectious diseases, we can really get down to what is the drug doing to the pathogen as opposed to the body. And an analogous uh, value, instead of the minimal effective concentration uh, in an infectious diseases, it would be the minimal inhibitory concentration. 
And, uh, and so I think at this point, I'm probably just going to start repeating a little bit of the, the information that Dr. Junkins was presenting a couple weeks ago. Uh, but to, to recap, our minimum effective concentration is the minimal amount of drug needed to inhibit bacterial growth. To illustrate that, I have this, uh, this graphic over here. And so to obtain the minimum effective co inhibitory concentration, we often do something called broth microdilution or, or, or really rather broth microdilution is a way to get the MIC. It's not something we do, or at least the true full, full version. But in broth microdilution, what you do is you start off with a one concentration of antibiotic. Usually we start off with one microgram per ml and we start going two full dilutions in both directions. And so going down, we see it goes to 0.5, then 0.25. And if we continued in that uh, trend, it would be 0.125 and then 0.0625, so on and so forth. Uh, starting here at one, going the opposite direction, we would double it. So two, four, eight. If we continue, it'd be 16, 32, 64, so on and so forth. After that, we'll take a set amount of bacteria, so a standard inoculum size, and we will inoculate each of these bottles with the same amount of bacteria. And then we will uh, incubate this overnight. Uh, and then after that, we'll see where the bacteria grew. And so for this example here, we see bacteria growing here as indicated by the shaded color, uh, bacteria growing in 0.5, bacteria growing in one, and then suddenly bacteria is no longer growing in two. And that's what we would call the MIC. Uh, and when it comes to the MIC, we often relate it to something else called the breakpoint. And the breakpoints are really just specific MICs in which we define susceptible, susceptible dose dependent, intermediate or resistant. And so for the example of cefepime, the susceptibility breakpoint is an MIC less than or equal to two. And so if we were gonna use this example here, we would actually deem this susceptible. Uh, and, and this is, and breakpoints are specific to organisms. And this is the, the Enterobacteriales uh, breakpoint. So this is, uh, for instance, this would be like E. coli. Uh, and so this would be, if this was, if this bacteria here was E. coli, we would deem this to be a susceptible E. coli to the Um, And so when we, we think about MICs, we're talking about inhibitory uh, uh, bacterial growth, but when it comes to treating infections due to these organisms, we don't wanna just inhibit the growth. We wanna try to get the most optimal efficacy we can. And that's really where we see this, this interplay of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics come in because it helps us determine what are our targets, what, how do we wanna dose our drugs get the, get the, to get the maximal effect. And when it comes to PKPA targets, the, the three primary ones are gonna be peak to MIC, uh, oops, sorry, uh, time above MIC, and lastly, going to be AUC to MIC. Uh, and so to start with the first target I'd like to talk about is peak to MIC. And so this is often uh, the, the PKPD target that aminoglycosides try to uh, get. And some examples of aminoglycosides are going to be gentamicin, tobramycin, or amikacin. Uh, and the way these, these uh, antibiotics work is that uh, essentially we want to give doses in a way that we get a high peak and not necessarily staying above a peak for a while. So in general, uh, the higher the concentration, more the kill, but it gets up to a point, uh, usually about eight to 10 times the MIC is like the, the sweet spot. You don't really get much benefit beyond that, uh, getting higher than those concentrations and you start to see much more toxicity. And so there's always a balance there. Uh, and when it comes to trying to dose aminoglycosides to optimize these, uh, or to optimally target these PKPD targets, what we've done is that we've switched our dosing. And so nowadays we call it traditional dosing, but this was the common way of dosing aminoglycosides years before. We would give smaller doses more frequently throughout the day. However, after there was more um, research done into pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and we discovered that PKPD or peak to MIC was the more optimal target, we started using different dosing called high dose once daily. And so instead of a small dose given several times a day, we gave a higher dose once a day. Uh, and then this is actually an easier thing to do. Uh, operationally, this has really become the preferred way of administering aminoglycosides. And really to further illustrate the concept of peak to MIC more, I just wanna show you this time kill study here. Uh, and essentially what a time kill study is, is that it shows you the amount of bacteria that's killed over time after exposure to an antibiotic. And so looking at our graphs here, the x-axis is gonna be time and the y-axis is gonna be the, um, the size of the bacteria inoculum. And so we're comparing tobramycin, which is an aminoglycoside, which exhibits peak to MIC killing 
to ciprofloxacin, which is a fluoroquinolone, uh, and ticrosilin, which is a beta-lactam. So each of these lines indicate different concentrations of the respective antibiotic in accordance to the MIC. So these ones here, the shaded in circles, those are gonna be controls where there is no antibiotic exposure. And then as you go down to the left, essentially, you're just gonna see greater concentrations of the respective antibiotic in relation to the MIC. Uh, each of these examples here start off with the same size inoculum, 10 to the sixth. And so we see that as we increase the concentration of tobramycin, we start to see either greater extent of killing or more rapid killing. And that's pretty consistent with what we would expect because it does exhibit peak to MIC killing. Uh, with ciprofloxacin, it exhibits AUC to MIC. So you see that as well too, but I'll talk about AUC to MIC a little bit further in this, uh, in this presentation. However, when you compare it to ticrosilin, which is a beta-lactam antibiotic, you actually do, you see like a plateau occurring. So once we get to about four times the MIC, we get, we get the same pattern of killing. We get marginally improvement once we get to 16 times of MIC, but the difference between 16 times the MIC and 64 times the MIC, you see here is not that big of a difference. And this is expected because ticrosilin is not uh, a um, peak to MIC or not an antibiotic that demonstrates peak to MIC killing. Tigrosilin being a beta-lactam exhibits time above MIC killing. And so time above MIC, like I mentioned, is mostly beta-lactams. Uh, and so the difference here is instead of trying to get a high peak in relation to MIC, we just want to get high enough for longer. Uh, and uh, that's again up to a point as well. So a lot of times we're looking at a target between 40% and 60% for the concentration to remain above the MIC, at least until we give another dose. Um, and some of the things we can do uh, to try to optimize our, our time above MIC killing with beta-lactams is either giving more frequent dosing. So if we were to give one antibiotic every eight hours, we might be able to optimize the, uh, the target of achieving the target of time above MIC by going from every eight hours to every four hours, uh, or we could extend the duration of the infusion. Uh, and so looking at this little example here, most of our um, IV antibiotics, we often give it over 30 minutes. And that's really what's exemplified by this red line here. Uh, this dotted green, uh, gray line is the MIC. So when we, when we give a drug by IV bolus or, IV, or intermittent infusion, we see a high peak is achieved. And then after we stop the infusion, we start to see somewhat of a rapid clearance. Um, however, if we were to extend the fusion, uh, uh, called prolong over here, indicated by the blue line, you see that it's a more slower, um, it doesn't get as high, but ultimately it stays above the MIC for a longer period of time, which for these drugs is going to be better. And then lastly, another thing we can do is just administer drugs either uh, via continuous infusion. And so that's where you start the medication and, uh, sorry, where you start the medication and then you just... Um, uh, you keep it going and it just stays above the MIC, achieving that target that we want. And our last PKPD target that I want to talk about today is going to be AUC to MIC. And uh, essentially what AUC stands for is that it's area under the curve and it's usually AUC uh, over 24 hours is what we're looking at. And essentially what AUC is, is that we have our MIC here and really what the AUC to MIC is, is just the area under the curve, at least this portion that is above the MIC. Uh, and when you think about AUC, it's a little bit harder to conceptualize, but um, in general, it's, it's thought to be an example of what the total drug exposure might be. Uh, a good example of this is gonna be vancomycin. Uh, and because you're trying to get an increase in the AIC, AUC, the things that you can do are actually both of the things I just mentioned uh, for peak to MIC killing and time above MIC killing. You can either increase the dose or you can increase the frequency or you can make it a continuous infusion. And really, really it's a, conceptually it's a little bit easier here. It's more intuitive is what you would think is that more drugs equals more kill, but always, you know, you have to take it in consideration of safety. Um, at least when it comes to vancomycin, what we do to try to optimize this target we, uh, we perform something called therapeutic drug monitoring. And what that is, is that after you administer this drug, we can actually get the concentration of the drug in a, the patient's body. And so we usually get them as lab draws from the serum. 
Uh, and then after that, we, uh, we, we usually get one or two levels. But then after that, uh, one thing that we've been doing, or a lot of, or not necessarily us, but a lot of places have been doing now, is that we've been using uh, software to uh, get those levels and then use other PK parameters from the patient to estimate what that AUC is, and then making subsequent dose adjustments to target a, um, a goal AUC to MIC. Uh, and so, you know, ultimately, what I mentioned today in terms of these dosing adjustments, they can be a lot of work. Uh, and so an important thing to always take into consideration is whether or not you want to do this is some of the practical pieces too. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, you know, we want to, we want to optimally kill these, these, um, these bacteria. And when you target these, uh, these PKPD targets, at least in vitro, you often do see that happening. However, in vitro does not always necessarily translate hundred percent to in vivo. And so it's important to look at some of our clinical outcomes data with that. And when it comes to some of this stuff, we have seen benefits, but it's not consistently across all populations. Uh, in general, the more sick ones, so critically ill in the ICU, or ones with significant PK, like pharmacokinetic alterations, uh, again, that tends to be either patients who are critically ill in the ICU or uh, obesity, uh, tends to be another one that uh, creates a lot of deviations from the normal, where we would have to optimize some of the dosing to try to achieve these PKPD targets. Uh, the other thing to consider is going to be our logistics. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, aminoglycosides, we went from smaller doses several times a day to one dose, one bigger dose once a day. Uh, that was kind of a win-win. So we get, we optimize our PKPD target attainment, and then we also make it logistically easier by giving a drug once a day as opposed to multiple times a day. And that's why we've just continued to do it. I mean, there's really no reason not to. Uh, however, when it comes to some of the beta-lactam stuff, it can be more difficult. And so given a drug more frequently is more work and more difficult. Give, uh, given a drug either prolonged infusion or continuous infusion could potentially tie up a line. And then a patient who might require administrations of other drugs throughout their hospital stay, that can be also be a logistical issue. Uh, potentially if a patient needs to move around in the hospital. So some you know, patients aren't always confined to their rooms. They need to go to maybe a surgical suite or an imaging suite and if that occurs, it can, it can create some uh, logistical difficulties. We can overcome them, particularly if it's needed, but we don't wanna put everybody in that situation if we don't necessarily have to. Uh, and then the last thing to consider actually is costs. Uh, this is not as big of an um, issue as it is now, or as it was in the past when a certain amount of these drugs were much more expensive. But a lot of times when you're optimizing PKPD targets, particularly with those beta-lactams, uh, by extending those infusions, you can actually give less drug overall per day. And so there are some cost benefits with that regard as well, too. Um, like I mentioned, it's not as big of an issue these days with a lot of the drugs that we give extended infusion, but we're getting newer drugs that are beta-lactam drugs hitting the market. And that's always still going to be something to consider as well. Uh, and before, and th this is really the last thing I presented the first time I presented this presentation, but I remember I got a really good question after I was done about how to use PKPD to, um, to address some of our drug resistance by uh, Dr. Ramirez. And so I wanted to provide that here in a little bit more depth. And so, you know, we're all in this, this, um, this field, or at least we're all familiar with the, the, the dangers, the impending doom of drug resistance. And a lot of times uh, we think, oh, you know, we've run out of drugs. We're going to be in bad situations. We need more drugs to hit market. But one fortunate thing we have in addition uh, to all of those things in our fight against drug resistance is optimizing PKPD um, uh, dosing for some of these bacteria. So looking at this example here, meropenem. And so when we think about meropenem, uh, the breakpoints I have here are for enterobacteriales. And so if an MIC is less than or equal to one, it is considered susceptible. If it's two, it's susceptible dose dependent. And that dose is based on a breakpoint of one gram Q8. And then if the breakpoint uh, or if the MIC is four or more, it's then the organism is then considered resistant. Um, and what I have here then is a, uh, what I have here then is a, a graph depicting the, um, uh, a PK, a pharmacokinetic and a pharmacodynamic study looking at different dosing regimens of meropenem and the likelihood in which they can achieve our target uh, based on MIC. And so your x-axis here is MIC, 
And your y-axis is going to be something called a probability of target attainment. Uh, if you remember for beta lactams, what we try to do is between 40 and 60% time above the MIC. When it comes to carbapenems, it's usually about 40. Uh, and that's the actual target they use in the study here. So these, these different curves here are going to be representing different dosing regimens of meropenem. And starting from the left and moving towards the right, you're basically just increasing the dose or increasing the, um, the duration of the infusion. So from going from 500 Q6 as a 30 minute infusion to a gram Q8 as a 30 minute infusion to two grams Q8 as a 30 minute infusion. And then finally two grams every eight hours as a three hour infusion. And so looking at our susceptible meropenem breakpoint and MIC of one, we see that all of those doses are, are highly likely to achieve that PKPD target. But then let's go to susceptible dose dependent. To, so two, looking at an MIC of two, we go up here, we see our highest dose is doing good. Our second highest dose is doing pretty good. Um, and really our, our next two doses are doing still decently. You know, they're around 90% probability of target attainment, but we do see that 500 Q6 go down slightly. However, once we go up to four, we see that dramatically decrease. And so using either 500 Q6 or a gram Q8, we see that we're only working with between 65 to 75% likelihood of achieving our target. However, when we look at a two gram Q8 over 30 minutes or two gram Q8 given over three hours, we're still very likely to achieve our, our target. And then lastly, going to eight, um, the two grams over 30 minutes drops off, but the two grams over three hours still remains highly likely to achieve our target. Uh, and so that's really what I wanted to illustrate here by understanding our, our PKPD targets and augmenting our dosing accordingly, we can somewhat, you know, in essence, overcome this resistance. Uh, and meropenem is a good example because this is the one most often that I use in practice to try to optimize uh, dosing, to try to uh, treat some infections that are seemingly meropenem resistance when we know that uh, with through dosing, we can actually still reliably treat those infections. Uh, so in summary, pharmacokinetics are what the body does to the drug. Pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body. Our optimal PKPD targets are these main three here. So peak to MIC, time above MIC, and AUC to MIC. Um, we want to optimize our dosing to achieve those PKT, PKPD targets to get the, the maximal antibacterial effect. This is a potential aid in our, our fight against drug-resistant infections. And ultimately, we need to understand the benefits uh, along with the logistical constraints. Uh, and so that concludes my presentation. What questions do you all have? Well, first of all, let me tell you, uh, Matt, there was, again, another uh, excellent review of pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamics and, and a very good explanation of how, you know, the, the use of PKPD can help us, even in the face of a resistant bacteria in the, in the hospital setting. This is, this is very important. Ruth, do you have any questions in the chat? None in the chat that I saw, but you know, I know we have a lot of discussion in um, infection prevention and a lot of times with nursing staff about, you know, antimicrobial stewardship and what are people's various roles. And, and so I know that, you know, when we are talking about the, the practice side, so what nurses do or others do in the setting, um, when we think about kind of those big ticket items with, with stewardship, we think about things such as how are, what are the procedures used in obtaining blood culture? And, you know, and, and making sure that, you know, that the elements as you were mentioned, um, Dr. Junkins had previously talked about, you know, the importance of blood volume and certainly the, you know, skin disinfection and those practices. But I wonder about, as you're talking about the pharmacodynamics, what role do you think um, it plays in, and maybe you've, you've gathered information about this. How often do patients miss doses how often are doses late? And what might be the role then when we think about, you know, what nurses' responsibilities are with stewardship and certainly making sure the drug is delivered, that actually is administered. What, do you have any thoughts about that, that area? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I um, so yeah, I think overall, my, 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 uh, my opinion of nursing involvement with antimicrobial stewardship is that it's basically the sleeping giant. I mean, it is by far the largest, uh, 
group of healthcare workers in the healthcare system. And, and I actually have particularly high interest in trying to incorporate them into a greater degree with the, the roles and practices of antimicrobial stewardship. But to reverberate what you're saying, yeah, absolutely. Uh, appropriate and timely drug administration. So adhering to schedules, uh, appropriate uh, obtainment of cultures. And so, you know, that dictates a lot of the antibiotic treatment that we use. Um, you know, I, I've always wondered about the idea of getting them more involved in um, appropriate culture, um, uh, like ordering. Uh, you know, I think that's a little bit harder. Um, and, and then really a major piece right now that Norton Healthcare has actually uh, implemented recently within the past year is utilizing them to uh, obtain more accurate penicillin allergy histories. Uh, and so we, um, we're trying to, uh, I'm actually currently working on a, like a follow-up project to that. Uh, to try to execute on that information a little bit to a greater degree. But when it comes to this, certainly, um, you know, we've, we've done a couple things. Uh, they, I think right now, um, for instance, vancomycin, uh, if you guys are actually remember from my presentation, the risks of antimicrobial use, I actually showed that vancomycin is the number one used antibiotic in the health system in 2021. Uh, when it comes to that, getting appropriate levels becomes a big deal too. Uh, and we've done a couple things uh, uh, to work with nursing to try to improve that. And that includes uh, certain targeted alerts on the uh, EPIC side to try to help them. And then also our pharmacists will round uh, and they will try to remind the nurse, uh, you know, it's probably not 100%, uh, but they will definitely make efforts to remind the nurse to get those levels appropriately. And our, our nurses are already pretty well accustomed to like seeing those levels and getting them. And then also, um, um, holding doses in, uh, for results for pharmacists to change the dose if necessary. It seems like that might be a, you know, a really big area of measurement if, if people are looking at, you know, at additional activities and bringing it down to the practice level. What are some very specific um, activities that, that impact um, antimicrobial use and appropriate delivery and perhaps then, um, you know, driving resistance? And what are some things that they have found that you know might be nice even to think about developing a, you know, some type of a of a checklist? What are those activities, and how might people, you know, do interventions, or how might they measure the, you know, the the current practices? So I put in the chat if people are doing those kinds of things, it would be great to share, you know, what they're doing or what their thoughts are. Um. Let me ask you, uh, Matt. Um, there, there are uh, there are uh, internists, there are physicians, there are nurse practitioners that that are. Uh, everybody has this this idea that that patients can uh, be moved out of the hospital or or going for an IV to oral antibiotics, or you are in a nursing home try to remove the IV catheter because of the problem with nosocomial infections. Then the idea of oral antibiotics are, are becoming you know, the, the gold standard. But you mentioned that whenever you take oral, the bioavailability is never 100%. Uh, um, two or three questions related to, to this topic. And uh, what would be the, the worst bioavailability that you may have? What, what would be the oral antibiotics that you say, well, these are, the absorption is less than 50%. And then I think what, what uh, suggestions you may have either to, what, what would be the type of patient that were to be concerned with bioavailability uh, and what, what, is, what are the areas, what, what advice, if I want to be using a lot of oral antibiotics and try to discontinue IV, what, what should be concerned? Okay, um, so let, let me uh, try to remember all three of your questions. So the first question is, was uh, what particular antibiotics are necessarily bad in terms of their bio 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 Good, yes, whatever you, uh, uh, so, so yeah, we, we often think about uh, antibiotics in terms of um, high, low, medium bioavailability. That's the categories people like. Uh, generally in that high bioavailability group that includes uh, your fluoroquinolones. So levofloxacin, and ciprofloxacin, doxycycline, uh, which is a tetracycline. Uh, metronide is also, there are a lot of options. Um, I would say off the top of my head, like uh, one that has particularly bad bioavailability is ceftonir. It's about 16 to 23%. Um, but overall, I, I want to add the comment that when we're thinking about PKPD uh, targets, bioavailability is uh, in and of itself not the end game. 
because you can have a poor bioavailable drug, but the uh, the amount of concentration that you need might not be that high. Uh, you know, so uh, a new drug that I think about this is, you know, this is not a drug that we would use for perhaps a bloodstream infection, but a new drug that recently came to market, amatacycline. So its bioavailability has an oral and an IV formulation. Its bioavailability is only about 33%. But very predictively, the oral dose is three times higher than the IV dose. And so ultimately, your exposure is somewhat the same. Uh, and so, it, you know, it, it's something to take into consideration when you're designing these things. Um, sorry, what was your second question? The second question is, is what type of patients would be concerned that, that they're not going to absorb as good? Uh, so leaving the hospital... Um, uh, you would always think about anybody whose gut is not normal, who, who doesn't have, who has an impaired ability to absorb. And so, um, you know, we have a lot of patients downtown that have pancreatic cancer uh, that undergo extensive surgeries and they have either short guts uh, or they're not eating food anymore. They're on TPN. So they're getting their, their nutrition intravenously. Uh, so, you know, they might have uh, impaired anatomy, but there might be ongoing atrophy because there's just not like being used. Those are patients I'd be particularly concerned about um, uh, absorption. Uh, other things, there's, there's drug interactions, going back to what I was talking about with metabolism. Uh, a lot of that is enzyme mediated, but you can also have uh, drug interactions that are not that. And so um, patients on tube feeds, I, I catch this sometimes, um, whereas the quinolones, like I mentioned, have high bioavailability, they will actually interact with tube feeds or really anything that has a lot of, uh, in general, they're called polyvalent cations, but examples are iron or calcium. They, they basically bind them up and they keep them from getting absorbed in your gut. And so th that's something you can mitigate, but that's something you wanna look out for. Uh, and then your last question, what can we do to try to optimize PK, uh, PD dosing? Is yes. that it? Uh, so, you know, what I'd like to see is just more, more studies than that. Uh, so it's similar to how we did it with IV, but there, there is a little bit of data demonstrating using higher than previously recommended doses and getting concentrations or, or getting a greater likelihood of meeting those PKPD targets. Um, most of that is in cephalexin and amoxicillin. Um, and then we just really never questioned it as much with the quinolones because their exposures are so similar to the IVs. But we're starting to see more and more of that data coming out. And I'm, I, I'm hopeful that we see more of that because I am interested in using more antibiotics to treat some of those infections that we previously, you know, kind of stayed away from, including endovascular infections or osteoarticular infections, since we've had those, those somewhat, you know, practice changing randomized controlled trials that came out within the past couple of years. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Do we have any other comments or questions, Ruth? No, we don't. That was, Matt, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that is, that's such an important area, especially as uh, the work that is being done by, by our Kentucky um, approach for improving antimicrobial stewardship. This is great to add this information uh, to that. So thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Thank you. All right, we will see everybody. Yep. What do we have next week? Let's see. Um, I, I can't remember, but it will, okay. will, it'll, it'll be one in our area of, of infection control, epidemiology, biostatistics, microbiology, um, or pharmacy practice. So we'll, it, it'll be a surprise. Next week will be surprise week. So uh, thank you, Dave, for putting information about the where they can find the recordings on the YouTube channel and uh, information then about Friday's program. Remember, we uh, nurses need our CE for licensure by the end of October. So uh, this way you'll be able to get uh, you know, almost eight hours of continuing education credits. So we hope that we uh, have you involved and you can all join us uh, via a Zoom and, uh, and hope uh, it's a, a good get together. I know it'll be a good learning opportunity. Thank you, Matt. Excellent. Bye. Thank you.